opportunity to enjoy the exhibit. Uh, it will uh, continue uh, on display through this Saturday, and you can check the Helix Center website for details. So I'd like to introduce um, our participants in tonight's roundtable, Creative Turbulence. To my right is Dennis Pelly, Professor of Psychology and Neurosci Neural Science at New York University. To his right is Enrico Fonda, postdoctoral researcher at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Next is Dana Karwas, artist and lecturer, Integrated Digital Media, the Department of Technology, Culture, and Society at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. And next to her is Luc Dubois, composer, artist, and performer, co-director of Integrated Digital Media and director of the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center, both of the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. And uh, joining us shortly is uh, Katapeli Srinivasan, Professor, Department of Physics and the Courant Institute, and the Eugene Kleiner Professor of, for Innovation, Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and Dean of the Tandon School of Engineering and University Professor, all at NYU. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, buckle your seat belts. We're about to encounter turbulence. <laughs> Perhaps, uh, Enrico, you can start by uh, telling us a little bit about the yeah, about the background, how, how this started. came about. Yeah, so I started uh, when I was doing research at the uh, University of Maryland in Dan Laser <coughs> Lab Group, and I was doing research on quantum vortices, which are quantum tornadoes that live inside uh, superfluid helium, which is a liquid helium at very low temperature, which has macroscopic quantum order. And so these videos were really kind of interesting, and we had a publication about it and some press release that was really interested by the by the public. They were uh, asking, asking strange questions even about it and seemed that it really inspired the fantasy of people about the, about the project. So we thought it might be interesting also to see it in a light that it's different from, compared to the scientific area. And so it might include it in some uh, artistic setting. So with that idea, then we decided to incorporate also some artists to collaborate with scientists to get together a show. And so we get together with Luke, Dana, Professor Srinivasan to set up this show. And so we had, the, you can see some of these uh, artwork before. The quantum vortices you probably already seen are those, the, the research that have been done before. And then there are some other one like work by Dana. Maybe you can tell us. Uh, sure, yeah. so um, can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> Great, so the piece I have out here is the one in the corner called Immutable Swell. And it was something that I was kind of thinking about for a while, but ended up putting together last summer when I was uh, near the ocean. So the piece was born out of both my fear of the ocean and my love of it. And I'd always look at the ocean at night and try to understand what, what was happening and why it was maybe more fe fearful at night to look at it than during the day or even swimming in it. And I started looking at different models of ocean waves just to try to look at the data and understand it in a new way, kind of in the same way that maybe um, in other projects I would look at maybe a thunderstorm through Doppler radar or through false image coloring. You know, you see the red area and there's a ton of rain or you see kind of like a green area and it's maybe not as scary. But then if you look at the thunderstorm itself outside, you can really feel it. You can see um, kind of like the synoptic meteorologists looking at the sky uh, before numer numerical modeling came around. Um, there was kind of a direct observation of knowing that something was coming. And I kind of took this um, departure from the normal scientific inscription that is very trusted, so I'm looking at Enrico because he is the scientist here among us, and I think that, and you, <laughs> yes, um, and Dennis. So just thinking about kind of this, going into this project, kind of thinking about new ways of uh, kind of experiencing scientific data mm -hmm. by still using it and using collection methods that were somewhat scientific. So for this particular piece, um, I, took my phone um, and it has a accelerometer and pressure data and location data and I wrapped it up in multiple levels of waterproofing, attached it to a fishing pole at first and cast it out into the sea on, in Truro, Massachusetts and watched it. Um, I, I actually swam out a few times and then with the fishing pole and cast it 
um, during the eclipse uh, over the summer because no one was in the water and I didn't want to disturb anyone. So I was by myself way out there and I floated with the phone back and the fishing pole just trying to kind of, and I was scared. It was deep. I couldn't, I'm very terrified of the water <laughs> and I ended up letting the phone go back and forth um, as a sensor uh, to, to shore. And then um, this happened multiple times. And I took that data, and I, it was recorded at 100 hertz. So there was dimensional data of um, me with the phone at first and then the fishing pole and the, the phone in the water. So I was able to collect um, over 500,000 data points of waves coming in to the, to the shore and breaking on the shore. So then I, I took that um, data and brought it through Python and kind of traditional ways of visualizing it and um, started to play with the form. So what is the dimensional form of this? How can I um, get this invisible kind of direct experience of floating in the wave uh, exported into some type of dimensional um, observation that someone could look at and emotionally feel that that's what it, it feels like to be floating in the ocean? Um, because all these wave models I was looking at, they were missing this dimension of emotional uh, connection to the thing itself. Like when I look at a model of a scientific wave, um, and there's very beautiful models, and they can show you hundreds of different things in a hundred, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of different ways, uh, I couldn't, I didn't quite ever say like, oh, that's what, it, that's what it feels like to be in a wave. So I wanted to k play with that. So I took all those data points and um, put them in a, a dimensional model and just um, extruded them into, it was just a cube that I kept twisting and twisting and twisting. But you can start to see the shape of the, the wave as it was hitting my body or as it was hitting the, the sensor itself. So um, I had it as a very complex uh, model, which is what the image is. And then I took the challenge of printing that with a machine um, back into a form, which is what you're seeing out in the in the hallway. Oh, he should come join. <laughs> so really, it's a question of scientific. How do we get um, beyond traditional scientific vernacular and inscription that is very trusted and uh, often um, looked at by a professional and it becomes, it can translate into the public or into the research and people trust that data, scientific data, um, and how to use other kind of visualization tools, kind of in the spirit of Edward Tufte, but breaking that even further and trying to get to a new way of looking at something or a new way of feeling something that is a phenomena that we all experience. And it's a break of kind of these scientists looking at this phenomena separate from the thing itself. And I know that's not possible at certain scales. So if you're looking at something at a macro scale or micro scale, or if you're looking at the Mars rover, there's no way that the person observing that is ever going to be able to see that data with their naked eye. So I'm very curious about kind of coming up with new ways to um, look at it in an unmediated, unmediated, almost like caveman way of looking at something or feeling something. Has anyone look at it, looking at it said that they could feel the wave? Uh, yes, once I told them it was a wave, <laughs> they, they could understand it as a wave, yeah. It's a beautifully romantic kind of, you know, the, my favorite, uh, my favorite art science overlaps always have this thing that's very human to them. So like I love the whole, you know, like you throw your phone in the water when you have a terrible breakup, <laughs> right? That's like, the, that's like the throwing the phone in the water, um, you know, and, and, and it's the same thing with like Raphael's piece in there, the idea that it's like an utterance. It's just like a very human natural thing and we're somehow leveraging what we understand about physics to show it to you. And I don't know, I think that's... I think that's really cool. That's a really good way to bring it home. You know, yeah. yeah regarding visualization of data, also the work by Collective Motion by David McLeod and uh, yeah. Porfiry, the professor at uh, NYU, uh -huh. uh, showing uh, this collective motion of particles that are interacting with each other and create this uh, fluid-like form that was in the theme of the, of the whole uh, project, was fluids. Mm -hmm. And and also that was a visualization of data, but interpreted to the eye of the artist. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, in fact, the, I was uh, overlooking the interaction. In the beginning, um, 
there were a lot of back and forth of data between the artists and the scientists because the artists said that the data of the scientist wasn't good, wasn't looking good for some reason. And so it's something that to be considered what is looking good or not. But mm -hmm. uh, eventually they found something that was meaningful, both scientifically and uh, aesthetically, according to the eyes of the artists. Yeah, and those decisions become completely subjective. So there's this moment where the, there's a kind of a, a testing process, I think, that the artists go through with whatever data they're working with, especially if they're working with scientific data or any data set or any phenomena, that there's a moment where it shifts to maybe how they're, they're looking at it and potentially discredits it in the scientific, scientific realm, but offers something else mm -hmm. um, that maybe the scientists won't be able to reach. So that's, that's a really interesting space to work in when mm -hmm. the data um, or the phenomena what you're looking at, when it's transitioning into this kind of subjective space of the interpreter or the right. new inscriber. Is it also speaking to sort of like the, the, the shared aesthetic qualities and experience that there, that there it resonates between the artist and the scientist, that they're experiencing something uh, uh, on a similar level? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the... Um, I guess from the 19, or even before this, um, in history, I don't know the exact date, but when the naturalists would go out and look at new land, or they'd find new species, <coughs> and they would take notes on, so these scientists would be taking notes on what they saw, and they would go back and they would hire an artist that could draw it better than they could, so you get these like beautiful atlases with uh, species from the beginning of time. Um, that were unable to be photographed because that didn't exist yet, but this dialogue that the scientists had to have with the artists to tell them, okay, the, you need to draw it like this. Because if the, if the scientists drew it, it might have just looked like a cartoon. So there's a kind of a communication that has existed for a while between artists and scientists trying to um, realize or visually interpret the phenomena. Yeah, back in the days, there was also Leonardo who was doing both. Right. before the science was born. Right, but Leonardo would consider painting an art. I mean, sorry, a painting a science. Sci also, yes, yeah. Because he, because of the instrumentation um, needed to be um, used in the painting. So he would, he, in Leonardo's time, he considered painting a science. Also because the painter had a divine mind and could see things the way God could. So there was an ultimate truth in what Leonardo was after. He's Professor Srinivasan. Hi. Apologies for being late. Oh, that's, that's, that's okay. We're, we're glad you're here. <coughs> Whenever Welcome. you want, also, we have the, the slides. When uh, everybody else has spoken, I'll say <laughs> Did you have some slides, slides that you yeah. wanted to uh, um, present? Hi. I had uh, four of them, or I still have four of them. Um, go turn it on. Sure. Yeah, Mostly, do it. yeah, go for it. Yeah. I wanted to say that, um, first of all, thank you for having us here. Thank you. It's new to me. <laughs> yes, thank you. My ears are not the right size. <laughs> um, so the, when you think about science and art, I know that um, these are quite often deemed as two different sorts of activities. And in fact, there are very immense differences. But on the other hand, if you go a little bit deeper, uh, all my friends tell me that the sense of beauty and uh, also its ability to evoke emotions are sort of very similar. I wanted to illustrate to you uh, one or two things. Here is the most beautiful equation in mathematics. Mm -hmm. Now why would you say it is most beautiful? It's not apparent to uh, people who are not trained in mathematics. So what it does is 
It's now, of course, uh, since 1748. It combines um, five very important quantities in this nice way. Zero, as you know, is just the um, uh, a quantity to which if you add anything, the quantity, it will remain the same. And that's the so-called uh, additive invariant. And one is something you multiply anything with, it will still give you the same thing. And pi, as you know, is the ratio of the circumference of the circle to its diameter. And it has been computed to 20 quadrillionth uh, place. That is not million, uh, billion, trillion, quadrillion, 20 times. And it still has no pattern and it keeps going, there is no end to it. I, as you would all recognize, is the square root of minus one, which is a strange quantity. And E is um, the so-called Euler number, which also has been computed to 500 billion places and it still continues ad nauseum. But somehow when you combine like this, all of that is somehow gone. All this complexity that you see individually is totally gone. And you have this extraordinarily simple formula due to Euler. And uh, it is like E equals MC squared or some very similar thing that people know. So uh, of course you will have to learn a little bit about to, uh, how to appreciate this. And that's part of what I think is in appreciation of art, literature, anything like that. And the other one, the next one, you all recognize this. This is the wave. Uh, can, you, can you go to the next one? This is the great wave of uh, Kanagawa in Japan. When Japan was for 250 years sort of removed from the rest of the world, it basically developed its own skills uh, in art, in uh, all kinds of other human endeavors. Mm. And you can see uh, the wave, the huge wave, which is now known as the rogue wave in the literature. Three boats now capsized, and there is the Mount Fuji at the very back with the snow uh, cap on it. And there are all kinds of uh, scientific uh, emotions that this will produce for us if, you, if I could go on at it, but I will not do that. And the third one, which again all of you remember, this lovely little um, part of the bigger poem. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep. So evoking that he has responsibilities that he can't take himself off from going into the woods and enjoying them, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. You can't uh, omit the fact that the last line has been repeated twice and repeated, and so it is really an um, extraordinary set of emotions that this will bring to bear on whoever reads it. And the last one is the topic of uh, the uh, conversation today about turbulence and, uh, and its beauty and um, what it has for art. It's just a jet that is coming down. You can see tendrils and vortices and all of them somehow combined in some very complex way. Um, there is an admixture of order on the one hand and chaos on the other. To me, that evokes again an extraordinary sense of beauty and extraordinary set of complex ideas. And, and to me, therefore, these illustrate somehow the kinds of things which I will not spell out for you. I think that uh, science has in, in in all its major endeavors. It's utilitarian and therefore people sort of don't understand that beyond the utilitarian aspect of science, there's all kinds of beauty in it and that's what really uh, gives rise to the satisfaction of uh, doing something worthwhile. And if truth and beauty can ever be equated to each other, well, maybe there is something to it. So that's all I wanted to say. Well, perhaps this speaks to your interest in the psychophysics of beauty. Okay, so I'll just say a couple of words about myself. But I, I wanted to join this discussion. Um, so I'm a psychophysicist. I study perception by behavior. Um, and um, most of my work is on object recognition, how we recognize things, how we read. Uh, but a new line of my research is trying to understand the experience of beauty. Um, so, uh, 
in, in thinking about what we would talk about tonight, I thought there was a danger that we might all agree. Um, so <laughs> I tried to pick something that we might disagree about. Um, so I'm going to take a position that perhaps others will uh, want to differ from. Um, but is it true? Uh, <laughs> well, that's what we'll argue about. Um, so um, so the, the theme tonight is this uh, magic show that uh, Enrico organized uh, about combining art and science. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect we all more or less agree about what science is. I think I would, making up a definition, I would say something about uh, an attempt to reach a mathematical understanding of something that's subject to test by prediction and experiment. Um, you might disagree about that, but uh, it seems more likely that we're going to disagree about what art is. Um, and uh, so I looked up what Wikipedia gives as definition of art, um, and I hadn't quite expected it, but it, it gives it a conditional on the year. Um, so let me just read it to you, it's only a couple of sentences. So, art is a diverse range of human activities in creating visual, auditory, or performing artifacts, artworks, expressing the author's imaginative or technical skill intended to, uh, to be appreciated for their beauty or emotional power. Okay, that seems reasonable. Um, and then it goes on to say, until the 19th, 17th century, art referred to any skill or mastery, it was not differentiated from crafts or science. Um, mm -hmm. So we were, uh, Dana brought up uh, uh, Da Vinci earlier, and you were suggesting about that division. It's, according to Wikipedia, I think he wouldn't have made any distinction that his paintings and his engineering are all art. They're, so art here in the sense of artifact made by man. Um, right, but he would also say it's science. He, he would, Leonardo, thought that painting in his era right. was science because so, of the instrumentation and also So those two words would distinguish his activities, right? <laughs> yes. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> and that's like legacy now when we say like liberal arts. So, um, right. so my sense is that the spirit of this show uh -huh. is actually a 17th century perspective of treating uh -huh. art and science as not having any division and that they are uh, demonstrating a mastery to share uh, an appreciation of the topic. Um, so w one of the things that, uh, if we're going to try and, and parse, would be actually whether the artist had the intent of um, producing objects that had the purpose of being appreciated for beauty or emotional power. Okay, that's my position. I'm hoping someone will disagree. <laughs> I would argue, I mean, being the, a person that created an artwork for Great. the show. Great, perfect. That, I mean, I really struggled. Is this, is this an artwork or is it just a really fancy visualization of some type of uh, phenomena? And for me, is I'm, I'm not sure if it's art in my mind. Like, I, I know it's an object I made. Um, I'm coming also from an architecture background, and it fits in a sculptural format and it was printed on really beautiful paper and it's this inkjet print but i'm i really struggle as someone creating and playing with this data as an experiment as i'm going through it in the process of just getting from the data set to what you see out there um comes well, down I'm to a, like i'm a former body surfer and so huh. i could resonate to your <laughs> comments about how attractive and frightening the ocean is yeah um, and how, how you had the, uh, the frustration in looking at a lot of other visualization work about waves that failed to convey any of that emotional energy and that you were, uh, that, 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 that missing bit was part of your motivation doing your piece. Yeah. Um, I was trying to seek, I was seeking some way to view it, I guess, for myself, which would be kind of, I think that would tip me over into the realm of an artist yes, in the I process mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> um, and also have served no purpose or consequence except for other people to look at it or myself to look at it and be like okay that looks like a really pressurized experience of what I'm trying to share while floating anyone else 
So the question is, will you distinguish like just the pure visualization of the vortices? No, when, when you made your piece, I think you collaborated in several of them. Um, yes, yeah, some of them were collaboration with artists. And were, artists were you just, trying to produce something that would produce an experience of beauty in the observer or, or some other strong emotion? Or did you have a different purpose? So I, I was collaborating on the scientific part, so I was not actually having the goal of producing something was in the mind of the artist, that particular task to deal with that. But there was a research about uh, a concept behind, for example, the work by Raphael Lozano Hammer. It was this, about this concept of the words staying in the atmosphere forever. He tried to conceptualize that, conceptualize that into a form of art and an object. And he actually tried different uh, kind of uh, pieces of art, but some of them didn't work out well like he wanted. And so eventually just one piece was uh, eventually finalized, like the one that was here, the 3D printed of the uh, flow of air of someone speaking. Same. So in this case, there was a concept that wanted to be expressed. And I think also some form of beauty, but you'll have to ask the artist, because I, I cannot sp speak for him. OK, so I, I'm going to push to. Uh, um, so I saw the piece, and I'm very interested in the concept of how it was made. and I. I was interested in seeing the form, um, but I wanted to ask, can, can we do a show of hands in the, in the studio? Please. Yeah. Um, so how many people were moved by the 3D visualization of the speech, the, the pressure pattern produced by the speech? Okay, and how many were not moved? Huh. Um, so uh, the sense of a, of a strong, powerful emotion that overcomes huh. you. You should, you should re-ask the question, having <laughs> defined it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? You should re-ask the question, ask it again. Now that we've defined it. Okay. So can, can we, uh, shall, shall, shall we vote again? So how many people were moved by the visualization of the speech pattern? And how many people were not moved? It's about 50-50. So that means a lot of people here were moved. So, mm -hmm. so that's a successful piece. Okay. Can I uh, say Please. Something? I don't remember the precise words that uh, Keats used at one time. But I think he said something like this. If you uh, begin to get into nitty gritty of things, you will sort of uh, detract from its beauty. That is to say, you go to the ocean, you admire these beautiful waves, but once you began, begin asking, well, at what speed are they going, or to what angle are they propagating, and uh, what kind of drop patterns it produces, and so on, Keats thought that it diminishes the beauty of the whole thing. On the other hand, there is another view which says, why? Why would it do that? The object that you saw before is still exactly as um, formidable as it was before in some ways, but now having asked these questions, you have a deeper insight into the, into the phenomena that you admired before. Will knowing, will the knowledge somehow diminish the beauty of the object? Um, now that's something that uh, many people think is what happens. That is to say, you see the sunset, it's so beautiful, but once you begin to ask, well, what's the spectrum of the sunset, you know, what, what angle is the sun setting, etc. It somehow seems to become mundane, but I don't see that that's how it should be treated at all. So in fact, th there is a speech pattern which you might abstractly admire, but once you somehow make a pattern out of it, you begin to say, is this what it is? And then you somehow lose interest or lose your ability to relate to this, uh, to the mystery that you had before. And to me, that somehow looks, even though I was not terribly impressed and I raised my hand for the second category, um, I think the fact that you somehow make it more concrete, make it more understandable, make it more, uh, more uh, expressible in terms of quantitative things, does not diminish the beauty of anything, as far as I know. That's my personal prejudice. My sense is it depends on the teacher. Um, so many of the works here were produced by physicists 
and I am reasonably sure that they love physics and that the more they study physics, physics doesn't become less interesting or less attractive by the process of study. Um, but there are some teachers who kill topics. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, what I was told as a graduate student was the purpose of your writing a paper is not to kill a field, and that is to say, <laughs> not say the last word on it, but actually to enhance the interest of others so it could be carried on further. So I, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, some teachers can kill the interest, somehow present it as a finished product, and then you have no interest in it anymore. But I think that comes back to maybe what I was saying a little earlier about this kind of um, knowledge formation around the topic, going to the teacher, or even um, the, the beauty found in the data, the quantitative mm -hmm. data. And there's, I think, the artists and... I think that what Raphael and some of these other artists are trying to do is essentially calibrate that quantitative information towards beauty again. So it starts as a phenomena, it gets removed from the phenomena into mm -hmm. the numbers, numbers, and then there's these kind of calibration techniques that are really specific to the artist and those experiments and calibration of kind of resurrecting the beauty back out of the data to be um, to be experienced um, is it going to kill the ex to kill the like looking at a sunset because even if you take a photograph of a sunset that can never explain what you're actually seeing mm -hmm. any photograph or any painting compared to what you're seeing and with your naked eye and it goes back down it for me it goes back to this kind of human or um, naked eye observation of being able to look at a phenomena. There is the, you made a point that somehow there is an abstraction of something that is evocative and that's what the artists seem to um, work on. So the point is that um, that's the kind of freedom that a scientist probably does not have in some sense. Mm -hmm. So you might say therefore they are somewhat different. That is to say the abstractions should still, in science, satisfy certain rules, which um, we think are, are, are right. Um, now, this constraint somehow uh, is the heart of the matter of the distinction between these two, um, uh, these two activities. Now, I'm not sure that uh, if you train yourself a little bit, that this requirement or the constraint that you have certain laws that you have to obey in how you abstract things and how you describe them and, and all that. Uh, I'm not sure that it should diminish the beauty of the, of the enterprise. That's my own, own thinking on this. But I know a lot of people think that the fact that you are constrained somehow, the fact that you do not, you, ca you cannot um, write down any arbitrary equation or or something like that, will somehow kill the originality, creativity, beauty, etc. On the other hand, the fact that you can describe something in nature in some quantitative ways is such an extraordinary phenomenon. It's, we have no right to doing any of those things. I mean, we are humans. We, somehow we seem to comprehend everything that goes beyond us, the universe. How can we, tiny specks of dust on the, in the universe, I can comprehend something um, so universal, so large and uh, so inspiring? So to me, it looks to me, it actually enhances and adds beauty to the whole thing, rather than diminish, uh, diminish it. You can say, how beautiful is this? But then you want to really go a little bit deeper, a little understand a little bit more. Why does it diminish anything? Why does it diminish the sunset? So, I mean, that's uh, one position, let's say. That's one I take, just because I, <laughs> you said well, not one, all of us should agree. I can bring up an example, <laughs> of, of maybe a fun example that everyone can relate to. Um, so when, in 1972, we had the... Um, Were you born at that time? Uh, not yet. I was maybe on the way. Um, so we're all familiar with the the view of Earth from space, um, blue marble, and 
that was a photograph that was taken by um, astronauts on Apollo Apollo 17? No, 11. Some Apollo. Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't have my facts right. But anyway, <laughs> the point is that this this single image of Earth was taken by a camera, sent mm. back down, um, and the intent of the image uh, wasn't by the um, the astronauts to just take this grand image of the the Earth that we 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 knew it at that time and still know it. Um, they just it wasn't part of the mission plan. So they took this photograph, um, it came back down, um, and NASA um, flipped it. So I guess when it originally arrived on the film, it was taken with the South Pole uh, right. facing up. So they, they flipped it, and then they color corrected it a little bit. And then that got put out into the world. And that had um, an effect on the, the astronauts who saw it and other people who've been in space, the overview effect. It's some emotional kind of shift that happens by looking at something um, from afar. But it can also happen to people who just see the photograph. So that's kind of one example of a phenomena, or maybe there's like an emotional um, addition to this. We mm -hmm. don't have access to that phenomena with our own eyes. It, it comes through a camera. So that kind of that's one example where it's like a surprise that happens with the technology and the science and the instruments that allowed us to take this image. And people, by just seeing this, um, had uh, emotional surprising reaction that was maybe mirroring what the astronauts were feeling or if they've learned about this feeling, you know, that there's no borders, yeah. there's this kind of Earth, not from space, but Earth in space, and how that image could have an, an impact. So I think that's like one example. Well, that was stunningly beautiful, yes, I agree. Yeah. And, and, and the way it was, the trip it was doing on your mind was part of it, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I, I do think that there is potential to have these dramatic emotional experiences through just one image. Um, We're showing people something that they thought they knew in a, in a strange way. Right. Which it is doesn't, a lot it doesn't look like the, the, the yeah. toy worlds we grew yeah, up with. Yeah, like we, we thought we knew the planet and <laughs> yeah. then we realized... All the political we lines are missing. Really <laughs> didn't know the planet. Yeah, and right? it's a question of scale. Yeah, you know, and that's the same thing with, this, with a lot of these things. It's like, you know, you can say... You know, you think you know the ocean, but I'm going to show you a different way that I know the ocean, or the web, or that I've instrumented the ocean, or that I've experienced the ocean, or I, I think I know how speech works, but I don't actually know how speech works at all. You know, like, like I'm, yeah, I'm, this whole like, you know, w w which way do you come in on a problem, right? It's, re it, I don't know. I always think it's really interesting, like, trying to figure out these categories. I, I'm, I was trained as a musician, right? So like, you know, J John Cage, you know, has this kind of canny riff that just music is is just organized sound right but it, but another way of saying it is the complete opposite of it. it has nothing to do with sound at all M music is emotionally manipulating people with physics algorithms and data <laughs> right it has nothing to do with anything with your ears right so like at the mi at the micro level instruments or physics some, you know there's things weren't running on physics then we like sort of add keys and chords and scales as their algorithms and then at the macro level you have a whole piece as an information stream right so you can make music in a million different ways that have nothing to do with your ears if you can just sort of change the terms of the definition and that's what i think is always exciting about this work and that's when you know when like enrico and i first met i like really enjoyed hearing him riff about you know the research the, the the physics research you work on because like you were talking to me about like how it sounds do you remember this you're talking about the spiracles and like they make cracking noises oh, yeah. yeah and you were yeah, showing me showing yeah and you were showing me this video <laughs> and i was like oh that's amazing it's like there's like you know this little like Giannis Zanakis piece in every you know <laughs> strand of helium and like if you could just get that out of there we could like make some kind of crazy you know, I don't know, thing that they, you know, could really evoke it. I don't know. It's just Maybe I could remark on your comment on music. Music is, you said, is organized sound. In some way, it's not the organization at all that matters, right. which also you said, but I want to say it in a different way. It's how different parts of music relate to the other parts, how an part really relates to the integral whole, 
That's what really is important. In science too, it is not the individual facts that are important. It's how they relate to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's, without really relating to each other, it's really just an isolated fact and that's not of yeah. any consequence in, in terms of, uh, in terms of we are discussing. Mm -hmm. So one definition of beauty would be how each, this is Heisenberg who said this, yeah. how um, uh, one part relates to the next part and to the whole. And that's really what music is, yeah. why it is special. After all, the notes are not that complicated. Yeah. And uh, well, if you listen to Mozart, it's a very different type of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Yeah. The well, conversation seems to have been more laminar than turbulent, so uh, I'm wondering if maybe we could transition to talking a bit more about the, you know, the turbulence uh, that uh, that these um, projects also. You, you uh, say something, Enrico. I would okay. like to. <laughs> well, we can start from from the word actually also related to the project that was um, that we are working on right now. We are looking at right now, and it's uh, about the confusion and creation about turbulence. So the Turbulence comes from the Latin word, verb turbo, which means to agitate, throw into confusion. And we use for the first time by, um, first time by Fedro in his Lupus and Agnus uh, fable to, des to describe the water stirred up by the lamb uh, that, inquinate, that polluted the water by, uh, to the wolf. But then was used by Leonardo da Vinci to describe the turbulence actually of water and was said turbulenza was the word describing it. And he actually was one of the first one really getting some big insights about the turbulence. And again, turbulence is something that is chaotic, um, random, and it's the motion of, of fluid. Mm. And um, he compared the motion of the fluid to the motion of hair. And he painted all these uh, nice vortices and describe uh, a cascade of vortices that goes from the large scale to the small scale. And so he had the profound insight also just by observing it. And he also poses some very important questions regarding the nature of turbulence, the creation of turbulence, how it maintains and how it decays that are still open. You want to? Yeah. You um, will remember this um, question. Who will rid this turbulent priest? Do uh, uh, you remember this? Uh, who, who will rid me of this turbulent priest? Yeah, who, who was this guy? Um, that's the first use of the word turbulent as well. Oh, um, you remember this? Uh, we're in the cathedral. Is it, right? this is, yeah. It's referring to Thomas More. Yeah. No, it's before Thomas More. It's this Henry. It's King Henry. Yeah, King uh, Henry is something, the, some yeah, number. Um, getting rid of... <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is a priest that he got. He yeah. really killed, and uh, Peter O'Toole actually played the right. role of the right. uh, of Henry, and and then um, what's this other guy who was uh, uh, Liz Taylor's husband twice? I forget his name. Yeah, Richard Burton. <laughs> Richard Burton. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. he played the role of the priest. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so. Who will read this? Thomas a Beckett. Piece? Thomas, it's Thomas, Thomas a Beckett. Beckett. Yes, Thomas oh, Beckett. Yeah, sorry. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's the, Same that's, idea, right? That's the, that's the, <laughs> Priests who get the, whacked because they talk <laughs> up to the kings, right? So that's the, yeah. Um, yes. So for us, why turbulence is uh, really important is this, as I, I see it. Um, physics has generally, for a very long time, um, taken one object at a time, like, for example, an atom or an electron in controlled circumstances and has studied its properties. And uh, you can measure, let's say, the charge on the electron to, I don't know, 10 decimal places or whatever number that is. Um, but it, uh, so that, that's how physics has really gone uh, for many, many years. But it turns out that um, when you cannot isolate objects, but the objects begin to interact with each other, then it becomes extremely complicated. And um, uh, this is how chaos came into being, for instance, when, let's say, three objects interact with each other, you can no longer predict uh, how uh, their evolution uh, takes place in our uh, long term. So in turbulence, the essence of the phenomenon is really interaction, interaction among 
its constituent matter, which could be vortices, it, like uh, Enrico said, um, it could be whatever else. So, um, in reality, most of what we observe around us is really interaction among many components. Humans interact with each other, government interacts with the uh, citizens in some way, businesses interact, financial markets are interacting. They're all the results of some interactions. So the real question is, when these things interact in some complicated way like that, is there some fundamental truth uh, behind, uh, behind these interactions? Um, if I, uh, it may be statistical in nature somehow or the other, that will transcend the real uh, specific details of the phenomena you're looking at. Would the finance mar financial markets have some properties that transcend the details of the financial market and would relate to what, uh, let's say, a flow of turbulent, turbulent motion of fluid has? So that's the question. So the ultimate question for many of us who work in this field is really to discover within quotation marks if there are such rules that transcend the specific details of the constituents that interact with each other. And if, it is, if that is the case, that would be spectacular. Mm. Uh, I don't know that that is the case. Each time we think we have some understanding of this universal aspects of it, we take one step back and we just find that that's not exactly right. Uh, so it may well be true that there are at some level um, they are probably similar. If you take the power spectrum of uh, the financial, let's say the signal on the, on the, from the Wall Street stock market, it may have some resemblance to turbulence. As a matter of fact, there have a, been a lot of people who have studied this. But you go deeper, one step deeper, this mirage of universality somehow disappears. If it, it doesn't disappear exactly, uh, but it will say that they are not really exactly the same. Hmm. You go one step deeper, you sort of figure out that really they're even more different. So it's like uh, peeling the onion one uh, level at a time. It looks like uh, you have, okay, you peel one layer and say, ah, okay, the next layer is there, etc. But you go to the core, there may be nothing, right? I mean, unlike apple, which has a core, um, onion maybe doesn't. So the fact is, we don't know whether there is such a universal uh, set of rules, um, but there are indications that there are. But if it is true, that would be a spectacular discovery that would really have great consequence intellectually, um, utilitarian way, and everything else. That would be why uh, we would study. Of course, we, we know if we understand it, we can save fuel on aircraft and uh, make the jets less noisy and all that. Mm -hmm. We understand that too. I think that's also very important. But at the bottom, as a person interested in the physics of it, the mathematics of it, that's really what drives us. So we write papers on the universality of such and such. And uh, uh, next paper, we are not so sure. <laughs> so, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's, that's how it is. I wonder, I wonder if you have more to say about the, the uh, dimensions of beauty in relation to turbulence in this topic. So, there was the, the, the turbulence, that was the relationship between turbulence and beauty was found in the painting by Van Gogh in somehow. In the third yeah. night, mm -hmm. there yeah. was, they found that the probability of difference, the difference of between uh, the luminosity of two points in the paintings is the same as the probability of the difference of the velocity of two points in the fluid of flow of turbulence. So, and this was, they found that, that it was um, mostly in the period where uh, Van Gogh was mostly chaotic in his mind, when he was uh, upset and almost crazy. I mean, and while the period that was more uh, relaxed, he, this uh, characteristic of turbulent motion in his paintings were, was not there. Yeah. We have a diagnosis for Van Gogh? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we analysts don't like to uh, apply <laughs> diagnoses to people we haven't examined. Especially personally. in public. All right. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I think um, for me, at least in thinking about beauty and turbulence, it reminds me of a study I recently read that um, ac across the globe, um, different painting, landscape paintings were put in front of different types of people um, to see if there was some type of universal beauty um, in landscape art. And the, the consistent uh, beautiful image that each culture had identified was uh, a landscape that had uh, these following components in it. So it had some view of the sky, some, green, some greenery, some trees, um, some type of path, and some type of moving water feature. So this goes also to my other comment that I'm going to say that um, often spaces, this goes back to my architecture, the pattern language. You get, anyone know about the pattern language? Um, it's kind of an architectural Bible that has different patterns that you can put together for designing a space. For example, windows need to be on two sides of a room. Those are the types of the rooms that people like to hang out in, in different houses, etc. Um, talks about curb height, and they're, they're kind of cute patterns, but also if you, you can design an entire community around them. Um, and my favorite one is that people are most happy when they're near moving water and flowing water. And um, this always makes me think about um, spaces that are successful, like Paley Park here. Um, on the, any, anyone familiar with Paley Park? It has a water feature, yeah. or even in front of the Seagram Center. So all these kind of water and moving water, even at the, we're not, this could be the layperson just looking at it, but it's about um, being near water that has um, psychological and uh, positive effects on humans. That's why we all go. Well, it also makes one wonder about the evolutionary significance of its potable moving water as opposed to still mm -hmm. water and as opposed to ocean, ocean mm -hmm. water is mm -hmm. potable and must have adaptive uh, 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 meaning to, uh, you know, and that's kind of the, con you know, you wonder about the connection between aesthetic perception, right, mm -hmm. and making judgments about survival. Right. right. There's um, a really wonderful book that uh, I think came out this past year called Blue Mind by Wallace Nichols, and they have a conference about Blue Mind, about um, the psychology behind being near water and the effects of water on the human. Um, it's a really wonderful book, but it, um, it, the author himself uh, puts sensors on his body and like jumps in the water and swims for miles. And, but they're more uh, physiological sensors, so it's trying to figure out also how he feels. And um, if anyone wants to check out that book, it's been a very, one of my favorites that I've read in the past year. What's the name again? Blue Mind. Uh, could, could I make a remark on your comment? Yes. Maybe related, but um, if it is not, please excuse me. So I grew up, uh, I was brought up and grew up in uh, an interior part of uh, another continent. And the first time I saw the ocean, I was probably 16 years old. Uh, for me, what was most beautiful was the kind of uh, environment in which I grew. There were mountains, uh, rocky mountains, and not huge trees. Um, it never bothered me about uh, that much. So we, um, until I came away to, let's say, New England and uh, something like that, I didn't quite really have a great admiration for greenery or flowing water or anything like that. So my sense of uh, what is interesting, what is uh, so uh, admirable somehow, uh, changed. It changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. in fact, on some other matters, I mean, I had a certain sense of what constitutes beauty in women. I mean it with no disrespect at all. But now, I, I'm in a totally different environment for many years. My concept of what a beauty in women is has changed altogether. Yes. Uh, if not altogether, I mean to a significant degree. So in some sense, uh, the question for all of you is whether all this is really not as deep as evolution and things like that, but it is maybe more controlled by your environment. How, how, if all I know is where I grew up, 
I don't know that I would appreciate some of the same things that I do now. Uh, so it may not be as deep as one thinks, it may not be wired in your, in your evolutionary means. So that's the question I had for you, actually. Oh, if, well, yeah. this was just something I was observing, and the results yeah. came back that these features. Yeah, I me, know. I, I heard I'm, what you said. I'm, like, yeah. Yeah. I'm more like you. Like I, I grew I, up in the Midwest, so there's yeah. no <laughs> ocean. I like a, a big, muddy river and rocks. Um, yeah, rocks. Yeah. I, I relate to rocks. <laughs> um, but there is something that's kind of, a, 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 the ocean is um, more mystical, or like it has a, a level of mystique for me that um, is, is, uh, that shifts between day and night even. Because if you look at the ocean at night, the, the, there's no color, so you just can see the forms, especially on a night with a full moon. You can really understand where the waves are coming from, how far they're coming, and it's, um, it's unbelievable to see the ocean at night. But also, I would never go in the ocean. At, has anyone gone swimming in the ocean at night, like way out? Not way out. Way out. <laughs> um, and, this is, and this is scary. Yeah, that's yeah. seems yeah. there's fear in that yeah. at least for me. In the and that's what that piece is a little it's bit like about. Big so. things we can't. Get. I didn't see the, I didn't see stars like a full night sky stars till I was a teenager. Because I grew up I grew up in cities with with oh, like so much light pollution. So I thought like stars was like oh there's like four of them. <laughs> You know, and then I went, and I had a, I, had a um, I, I took like a road trip my sophomore year in college or something like that to Vermont, and then the sun set, and I was like, wait a minute, what? You know, and and that was like this really amazing, you know, thing where you know you see something just that you thought was kind of manageable and simple, and then turns out to be incredibly awe-inspiring and complex, gives you a little bit of perspective. That was my like blue marble moment. It was in, it was backwards though. But it was that like you thought you knew the planet and then you definitely didn't know the planet. You were like, oh my god. Yeah. So when people do cross cultural studies on aesthetics, one thing that comes out as a universal is a preference for curves over angular or angles. Um, mm -hmm. that doesn't disprove it being cultural. They may just be cultural commonalities. Uh, returning to turbulence for uh, another minute or so. So we all uh, know that flow through a pipe is turbulent very often. Um, the jet e exiting from an aircraft is turbulent. Uh, the oceans are turbulent. Um, the air quite often moves in turbulent ways. Um, so there are two different views of looking at turbulence. Um, in a certain sense, what happens inside the pipe is quite different in, from what happens inside the ocean. Um, because there is friction on the walls and uh, pipes are of finite length and all of this kind of stuff. And oceans, although there are walls, they're so far away from uh, the main activity that the walls may not have any effect. Uh, therefore, one line of uh, inquiry is to study each of these classes of turbulent flows on their own merits. So one becomes an expert in turbulence in pipe flows, another becomes an expert in turbulence in ocean, etc. Uh, but there is the second part to which I made uh, allusion earlier, which is to say, yeah, there are specific aspects that are in, in fact different from one flow to another. But is there an essence of the turbulence, so to speak, that transcends each of these uh, real specific things? And uh, what is that? And if it is true, is it a good model, even going uh, more general, is it a good model for studying the interaction among many components, a large number of components, in some nonlinear way? Nonlinear way that you can you sort of forget about the details of where you started. So that's the uh, line of inquiry. But when I'm thinking about turbulence, uh, how it's how it's embodied by by humans that are feeling it upon them themselves, either as an airplane when you're on an airplane, or you kind of understand this movement. And um, 
I think one um, journey through turbulence, through many different layers of turbulence, could be the human experience or how it's impacting something mm -hmm. um, that can be that can be felt. Um, my brother's actually an aerospace engineer, and his PhD was um, how uh, turbulent flow uh, goes over the wings of uh, jets and um, makes all these crazy models of it. Um, so for him, it's just about you know like going and being in a wind machine and observing it. Um, and he actually has like a little jet that I think runs off of algae fuel, just as like a, a pet. Um, in his garage, but um, just kind of trying to understand this, um, the way he's looking at it um, as a model or through computation or through air. And, and when we're flying with him, he loves it. Like when we're, when we're on an airplane that's getting tossed around in Colorado or wherever, like it's like flipping upside down. He's like, this is awesome. Um, but I think that it's about that kind of, um, is there a way that there's an embodied experience? Maybe not through, um, human but other species or other like birds or um, other entities that are living that are being impacted by this. Each to himself or herself. Yeah. <laughs> See, uh, presumably in human mind um, at any given uh, uh, any given interval of time, a zillion thoughts fly through. Um, I'm saying it in not in any real rigorous way, but so many many thoughts uh, go by. One thought uh, does not continue in the next instant, etc. So, so there is a very poor correlation between what you think now and what you might think next minute, especially for people who haven't concentrated on their mind too much. See, in turbulence too, something like that happens. That is mm -hmm. to say, there's only finite correlation between what happens here and what might happen a little bit later. So I have often wondered whether in fact there are models one can make, models, mathematical models, that have finite correlation. I, you know, if you're a yogi, for instance, you concentrate on one thing for hours on end and mm -hmm. the same thought. But most people are not. Most people are, you know, just fleeting thoughts um, enhanced uh, by the complexity, enhanced by the environment around oneself. So it may be that there is some um, a deeper model one can actually del I have wondered sometimes between how the mind works and how let's say turbulent flow outside of the humans work. Um, so that might be very interesting and you are uh, interested in mind and, uh, and how it works and this would be a very fruitful line of dialogue at least until we decide it is useless. Yeah. Yeah. So. Do, you, do you have any uh any speculation as to uh, what some of the underlying connections So, uh, are? of course, uh, there are spatial characteristics in the mind, or the brain, let's say. Brain and mind are two different entities, I understand. Um, uh, presumably, they are very strongly related, <laughs> even though they're separate. So there is the uh, spatial structure, and then there is the temporal variations that take place. And somehow these are all connected to thoughts. And um, one should be able to uh, somehow connect them. Um, and at least at a level of speculation, it would be worth, uh, worth thinking about. So um, there has been a, quite a bit of work on EEG um, yeah. with thoughts that are uh, perhaps parallel to what you're suggesting. So, um, when we are uh, asleep, there's a very strong alpha rhythm, yeah. um, and then when the person's awake, you get less rhythmic behavior. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what kinds of correlation links you get uh, before you can't predict. Um, yeah. I, I haven't done any EEG yeah. work, so I'm not sure. 
Yeah. Uh, be, uh, very interesting. Um, my son uh, uh, maps the brain and uh, using FMR, uh, fMRI machines. And then he tries to understand the relation between patterns on the one hand and functionality on the other. Um, I'm not even sure whether the ideas are very uh, properly formulated. Well, fMRI isn't very good for this because it has a time constant of six seconds. So it's, it's not directly measuring neural activity, it's measuring the blood response. Um, and so you, you don't really get temporal dynamics out of it. Um, so there is the MEG so, machine, so, uh, so, which I think So is, EEG is and MEG yeah, yeah. both respond fine. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and uh, yeah. they would be fine for looking at that. Yeah. Uh, dare we uh, delve into uh, the quantum dimensions of turbulence uh, in our discussion? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, quantum mm -hmm. turbulence is this turbulence that happens in superfluids, which are uh, uh, which is liquid helium at a temperature below 2. Point Kelvin, 2.17 Kelvin. And um, it has a macroscopic quantum order. So there is quantum mechanical effects on large scale. And you have these uh, vortices that instead of being all of different sizes like you have in a normal flow, they are quantized. So they're all the same and are m all multiple of the certain quantum of circulation, which are certain quantity. And they are, again, of atomic size, like we were saying, in width, but microscopic in length. And they interact in different ways. And uh, you've seen, if you've seen the videos of quantum vortices there, you've seen the wavy motion they have. And it's um, at, very important for many reasons in the order of the dissipation of the energy in the quantum turbulence. And you have this mechanism, which is called reconnection. When two vortices get together, they get together, they uh, exchange tails, and then they separate. Mm -hmm. And you probably have seen also, you, if you haven't, you can look then later at this mechanism, which is, again, central to the mechanism of dissipation. And dissipation is important because in, you wouldn't think that in a fluid, which is completely without friction, you will have any dissipation. But in, 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 actual, in fact, you have also dissipation in a quantum fluid. And so that is also one of the reasons you would like to study quantum turbulence to see how dissipation compares between the classical and quantum flow. Could I maybe uh, add a little bit, maybe Please. just uh, make it uh, less technical than uh, Enrico said. Um, at ordinary room temperature and pressure, etc., the fluids that we know, air and water and others, um, they do not have any quantum mechanical properties. Or they do, everything is quantum mechanics, but it somehow gets smeared out so it doesn't really matter. So we are all, always looking at um, water and air and things like that, where there are these vortices, um, but each vortex spins differently. That is, diff the magnitude that you can associate with those vortices will all be different, uh, they can be all over the map. So there is no restriction of any sort. And so studying the interaction among them, which is really one of the primary objects of turbulence studies, uh, becomes a little bit more complicated because you have so many dissimilar objects that are interacting with each other. But it so happens that if you uh, take a fluid uh, um, that can remain uh, in a liquid form, even at very low temperatures, helium is the only one that remains a uh, liquid if you go below about 2.7 Kelvin. Everything else freezes and it becomes a solid. But this one, for whatever reason, remains, uh, remains uh, um, a liquid. And then quantum mechanical effects begin to show up uh, somehow. And this is what he was saying, long range order and things like that. The manifestation of this uh, emergence of quantum mechanics in fluids there, one of the consequences is that these vortices, which in uh, room temperature were all very dissimilar and things like that, they become really ordered. The circulation around them, that is to say the strength of these vortices, are all identical. 
Uh, therefore, one thinks that somehow in studying the interaction of identical objects will be much easier to understand. And in fact, if there is any element of truth to what I was saying earlier, that really interaction among elements is really what matters to understand turbulence, not so much what the objects themselves are, then the promise is, or the thought is, that going to quantum mechanical um, uh, temperatures, lower temperatures, where quantum mechanical vortices become, uh, become manifest, it would be easier to understand and it would be easier to simulate on a computer. It would be, therefore, lead us to understand that is really of interest to us, which is turbulence around us and inside us as well. And uh, Enrico was, uh, 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 so this quantum mechanic, quantum vortices have been around as thoughts for a long time. Feynman actually was the one who proposed the existence of these quantum vortices. And then there was some flurry of activity on this. But nobody had seen these vortices for a very long time. So my graduate student, Greg Bewley, was the first one who actually observed these vortices. And Enrico actually followed him, and he made uh, many improvements on how to, um, how to visualize them, and then also interaction among the vortices, which is the part that he was talking about earlier. Well, I think we're going to open it up to uh, questions uh, from the audience. And uh, if you could step up to the microphone and say your name. And uh... Hi, my, my name is William Grassi. And um, uh, I'd like you to talk about fluid uh, dynamic equations and the different aspects of that. So it's heat and viscosity and pressure and what's the, Fluid, there are four things in the velocity. Velocity, right? Okay, and <coughs> and I, 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 so these are the equations that you're using to map out turbulence on an airplane wing or whatever, and they're nonlinear. And my question is really, um, can we think of those uh, four um, dimensions of uh, fluid dynamics uh, metaphorically? Um, in, in, in a sense, if, the, if these are the, the components of creating turbulence in, in uh, gases and, and liquids, um, is there something, is it, can, can we play with that metaphorically in thinking about art and the creation of art? That's, that's the question. It's a very interesting question. That's a good you question. <laughs> that's a good question. You go, Dana. So thinking about, just to, to um, repeat the question, so can these um, equations for term turbulence be metaphorically thought of as, as art or in art or uh, heat could be emotion or right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a very good question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you, if, if you could if you could do it for economics and, and yeah. markets, you'd get very rich. Well, but there is no. Right. Well, there's an interesting um, art project in which um, some artists took the stock market data and remapped it to um, a very believable mountain topography, and right. they rendered it uh, perfectly. Mike, Michael Najjar. Michael Najjar, yeah, Michael yes. Michael and um, so they um, spatialized the, the information and the, these equations in a certain way. So I, I do think that they're... Um, are opportunities to, um, when you use the word spatialize the information um, into um, some type of known representation. So it could be landscapes, or it could be um, color, or it could be um, many things. So there's endless opportunities. And I guess that's the problem with art, <laughs> because yeah. there's hundreds mm -hmm. and hundreds of ways to look at it. But there's something that, um, I think crosses over between the two, and that might be um, showing that showing something that's invisible, like bringing visibility to it. So I think that's um, where the metaphor would start for me, at least, if I was to look at this, um, and I was to look at turbulent flow over an airplane, and I can look at what 
my brother's doing, or I can look at these. Uh, what I was excited about, I think what Enrico said about the tail switching. Did you say something about tail switching? I mean, just like thinking about that, that's like, that's crazy and wild mm -hmm. and this kind of uniformity that happens below this temperature in helium that, that Trini's uh, mentioning. So there's so many um, ways to make this more visible in different ways. Um, but the interesting thing about um, the piece out there is you can actually see it and it's a camera. Um, to take maybe a higher level stab at your question, like, um, you know, one of the things that, that I've been working on a lot is, is problematizing this cultural moment that we live in, where we sort of live in the era of the, of the quantified selfie, right? We have, we have all these tools around us around instrumenting our lives, right? I've got five things on me that are measuring me right now, right? I've got my, this thing has told me I, my heartbeat and how far I've walked today. I've got, I've got this thing with all my email, all this stuff. And I think to, to, to Srini's point about like, you know, these, these very simple interactions add up to things that we can't predict, right? And, and that as a metaphor for like humanity and life and all this stuff is something that I think artists you know, have, have this lens on that is worth like valorizing and preserving the idea that it is, that it is complicated. I have a, um, I have a self portrait that I made once where I took all of my email, right? So like about half a million emails, something like that. Um, and, um, you know, so like every email I've sent in like 20 years or something like that. And I took all the names, everybody I've ever emailed with, stuck them you know, kind of in the middle of a visualization and ran a, and ran a um, it's called a force directed graph, right? I, r I run a physics equation on it. So I blow them all up and give everybody gravity based on how long they've been emailing each other, how much they've been emailing each other. And then I would do sort of sentimental analysis on the email, on the name. So if, if I say, I love you, you're heavier to me, mm -hmm. right? And what happens is it ends up making this constellation of my life. Right, where there's kind of this main line complex and it's very messy. The network? Yeah, it looks like it's, it looks like a big graph. It looks like a big graph of everybody I've ever talked to. And I hand wrote all the names. So it's not quite as, you know, it's not quite as digital as maybe I make it sound. Um, but like those, the, that thing of, you know, these very simple things adding up to things that are really complex can be, you know. Don't try to give you a high level answer. I'll try to give a low level answer. <laughs> yeah, okay. There you go. I mean, try anyhow. So um, I'll interpret your question uh, the following way. If you take a gas flow, gas has zillions of molecules. Zillions is not a word, but still. Um, and so each molecule um, must have some effect on how the flow happens. But it uh, just so happens, for most purposes, you don't need all these zillion things. You only need, as you said, five variables, pressure, density, velocity, etc. And uh, so, uh, in general, when you are looking at a very multidimensional uh, phenomena, it may very well be that there are only a small number of things that are of interest and importance for us. And that's what you, uh, happens in fluids, and that's what you said. So the question now is um, whether in other uh, human endeavors, um, there may be many influences uh, that are happening on, on a thought or an object or a person, but really how many of them are important? And if in fact this huge multidimensional space can somehow be reduced to a small number of dimensions. Certainly in financial market, every investor, how uh, he or she gets into the market will have some influence on the, on the behavior of the stock market. But actually, uh, maybe not all of them are important. Maybe what happens to Apple may be much more important somehow. And so if you know a small number of things, it's conceivable that you can get, and that's the purpose of S&P and all this business, that's what they do, mm. right? So you might ask, therefore, an artist, when uh, she works on something, whether um, the multitude of influences that you think will influence uh, the production of an art, are they really important? Are the multitude of thoughts that happen inside the brain, inside, the, uh, um, uh, inside our own uh, world, uh, will all of them matter? Uh, probably, yeah, in some way. 
Uh, every little thing will have some little effect, but is it only that there are five or ten or whatever variables that really uh, control what happens? It may be, as you said, Luke, it may be the technology of the moment, mm -hmm. it may be the, uh, the cultural background, it may be the political environment in which you live. Um, I don't know. I mean, are your upbringing, are the tensions that you had when you were a child, maybe there are only a small number of things like that. And that would be interesting to explore. Of course, I don't know the answer, but I, th I really like the question anyhow. Yeah. I simply elaborated my understanding of what you said. <laughs> So uh, I don't have as much background in science, but I felt that painting or art was a little bit minimized here in its methodology. And I've spoken before and probably have said some demon things like that word beauty has to be reconsidered how it's spoken about. Because for the most part, artists, most when you read artists' writings, they don't say I'm working toward beauty. This is not what they say their motive is. And so what then is the artist trying to do? And I, there were some topics that came up that began to touch on it, like subjective and objective, the relationship of science to the subjective and the objective. The relationship of art is a little different. Now, science, you mentioned, has constraints, and I like that. But so do the arts. They have languages. And languages mm -hmm. change. They're complex, but they still have some constriction. And so if you think about painting, for instance, they've dealt with these issues, but in a very different way. Space and time, for instance. The futurists were very interested in the concept of time. The cubists were interested in space. And so within that framework, they try to devise a language. Things are more complex today. And um, art is really not the thing in itself it is a building block, just like science is, toward a relationship between the self and the outer world. And to define how science is, that is where the difference lies. What is the relationship between a scientist and the outer world, the subjective and the objective, and what is it in the artist? And the artist is an individualist. The scientist is too, but in a different way. I mean, Cezanne said, I'm just a link in the long chain of development of my spatial concepts, my way of creating a landscape. Oops. Oops. <laughs> anyway, I, I, it's, I just want to speak up a little bit for the arts because it's, it's a very complex subject. Can you tell us what you tried to do as an artist? Well, I can't. <laughs> it's like people say always to me, are you realist or abstract? And I find those questions ridiculous. Um, I am interested in states of mind, and uh, de Chirico spoke about it, and he called it stimmung, and in Indian music they have ragas and things, mm -hmm. but um, states of mind, uh, I don't know, maybe it's more in the realm of study of the mind, I don't know quite how in science you would deal with such a factor, but I'm interested in states of mind and ways to... Um, I consider myself a poet painter. So I, I'm interested in words in, as equivalents in shapes and forms, the way a poet would be. All right, that's, but I, I do feel that there needs to be a lot more bridges today. There were bridges in the Renaissance, but there needs to be a lot more bridges today about the complexity of the problem. And it, it can be discussed, but it's very difficult because we have to get a language set up for that. What's so different about today? <sighs> there are so many pictorial languages existing. There are so many varieties of what art is today. It's extended beyond the canvas into the space you live in. It, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it has ranged all over, so we no longer can speak that there's only painting and someone will be doing a performance and they'll say that's an artist. So we have a lot of, it's a vast topic. Now, in science, I don't know if you have the, the equivalence. It's the same that it has spread so much that one part of the uh, gr one group of scientists can't relate to the other group. Mm -hmm. But once in a while, something happens in science that is a concept arises and it will collapse a number of things which seem so disparate in the beginning 
And now they are all uh, sort mm -hmm. of talking about the same. In art, I don't know if that happens. I totally agree with you what you said, that it has become uh, uh, very I think the I, I came because the idea of turbulence. I think mm -hmm. fixed form is a problem both in the visual world, probably, and in some way in, in the sciences. And I think artists are struggling with what, you know, form in forms in space and ir the irrational elements and the unknown elements. And there's a lot of, well, it started really with abstract expressionists who try and explore the inner life and try and explore the inner life. They got into a spatial realm that was also undefined in terms. So I think the languages uh, are, are, you know, what you just said, it's, it's whether we'll find a universal language. I don't know if we want to. I think the excitement in art is the X factor in which you don't know if you want to find the answer to X, but it's the journey that's important. And I think artists are very involved with journey more than anything. Yeah. Thank we you. would say the same too. Mm. It's not being there, but the process, the same. becoming. Mm -hmm. Becoming instead of being there is really the the essence of That's science. Very actually. much the contemporary yeah. world, yeah. The, the the journey, and the yeah. and yes, very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your That's very great. interesting comment. Yeah. Hi. Um, um, so I teach uh, English. Um, at a uh, high school level. And um, so one of the things that uh, teaching um, in terms of two cl courses that I'm teaching, both pretty much dealing with sort of like the idea of like um, what is art in terms of like, so I'm just going to ask a question. Um, isn't it the job of both science and art to alert us to to alert us and extend our understanding of meaning. Um, and then thinking of meaning in terms of like, what is the archetypal, you know, that extends beyond time and space? And then how does the archetypal extend to our current collective unconscious or the current zeitgeist? Right? Um, one of the things I was thinking about, like when you guys were talking about turbulence, um, and if you can speak more to this, um, isn't our understanding of sort of what is chaos or what is turbulence um, or what is sort of even confusing, um, just sort of where we are at the moment, you know, um, and isn't that, isn't that sort of understanding of like, I was looking at my notes here. Um, the idea of like complexity of modernity, the same thing, in the sense that like complexity is modernity is always moving, and therefore complexity is always moving, and therefore like what we don't understand and what we come to understand is also always moving. Can you take hers? Um, I'm not sure exactly what uh, uh, you were uh, asking or uh, you uh, were saying actually. So the, in chaos, uh, what, what happens is um, you start with certain types of initial conditions. That is, um, you know, one is born a certain way, uh, one's uh, color is that, etc. But all of them gets forgotten. Uh, in a certain short period of time. Um, uh, that's the essence of chaos, that is, initial conditions get forgotten and uh, the evolution really leads you so far away from where you started that it um, uh, doesn't matter. And then you have the complexity. The complexity comes in by the interplay of this, um, this uh, forgetting about initial conditions and the relation to relation of that to the environment. So I think we are talking about words roughly the same meaning, uh, although it's not entirely obvious. 
So now, uh, after that, I lost uh, track of your thread, uh, thread of your uh, question. So please repeat it for us. It seems to me that sort of like the pursuit of like the, the sort of the job of the scientist as well as the artist mm -hmm. is to sort of capture the current moment. You know, like the artist, you know, as an English teacher, you know, I teach that, you know, Mary Shelley is as a 16 year old sitting down and capturing the Industrial Revolution through mm -hmm. Frankenstein. You know, um, and then you have all of these artists over the point who are sort of capturing our current understanding, but it's so complex, you know. And also, like, science kind of, it seems to me that the scientist does that as well. Like, they only work so to sort of, like, come from T.S. Eliot, like, I can only work from the school of, English that I've, that I've built up to this point. And it, it seems the same for the scientists. Well, you know, I, I think your question is so large that it, it, might, it might be something that you can also maybe, you know, address after the... Can I make a quick yeah. response? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think we would all agree that there is this challenge of anyone working in areas which are trying to achieve understanding of dealing, for example, with this very complex world we're in. Um, and Professor Srinivasan was pointing out some similarities between art and science. So I would like to add to that some important differences between art and science. Um, and that one of them is the one concept of one truth. Uh, this came up actually just before we met with uh, Rob, because he, in psychoanalytics, they allow for multiple truths. Um, oh. <laughs> some people allow for them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you. Um, but it's a, a defining quality of most of modern science that we only allow one truth. Um, and so a proposition is either right or wrong. Um, and we work very hard to show it's right. Well, actually, people propose things and everyone tries to show they're wrong. Um, but in the process, you then often create new things that are slightly different that will withstand all the attacks. Um, and that concept of having one truth, I don't think really has a parallel in art. Um, and many people think that the, uh, the ability of science to make progress, so most of our modern technology, um, comes from that uh, uh, method of reasoning, of, of thinking that the world is one way and that we must prove things. And so it's a, it's a very different way of thinking and working. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about the fact that, you know, like, like my seniors, one of their senior essay questions was sort of, oh, I'm sorry. So one of the senior questions for this year was, like, chart the, the death of the, like, the progress towards the death of the meta narrative from, like, the classic period to the, to the postmodern post period. You know, and so with postmodernity, we, we have that sort of, at this point, questioning of, of like exact, like this idea of the ultimate truth, like the meta narrative, right? And it seems like with, with science, you know, cause we talked about the fact of, you know, the Copernican papers, which were, you know, 200, which were published and then 200 years, you know, under the Pope until like finally released, which with, even with science, you had this sort of, constant challenging of, you know, like with Einstein challenging Newton and all these other things, right? 
Thank you. Yeah, we, we can continue the discussion, but I want to just leave yeah. time for other people to ask questions. Anyone has? Hello, I'm Bob Langan. Uh, I'm a psychoanalyst with the White Institute. And I'd like to go back to the Euler formula, which I had never seen before. So you showed that, you said how beautiful it was. It struck me as very beautiful too. I didn't understand the item with the, all of the uh, exponents and so on. But that plus one equals zero. So it's an equation. You take away one from the left side, and take it away from the right side, and you have uh, the exponents equal zero minus one. Now, mathematically, of course, you ignore the zero, but you can also pause and ask that question, how can you take one away from nothing? How can nothing have anything to take away from it, right? And what this brought to mind in relation to the, the rest of the topic about uh, turbulence and how things change, uh, was the Heart Sutra in Buddhism, which essentially is emptiness is form, form is emptiness. A big paradox, right? How can form be emptiness and emptiness form? Well, you know, I think a related aspect of this is impermanence, that everything is changing all the time, that it's not just the breath forming that weird shape. It's the clouds of our thoughts appearing and disappearing, just like that. It's our bodies going. You know, it all depends really the dimension I think that was left out or not emphasized so much as time. You know, if you speed up the clock, everything's gone before you know it. And you slow it down and it seems like we're here, you know, with a certain degree of constancy. Uh, but everything is affecting everything else. There's the Brownian motion of, every mo of the molecules in our ears. Everything is disappearing while it's reappearing. Creation, you know, it's like at the quantum level, too. Things are here, and then they're gone, and then, you know, or they're gone, and they're not gone, and they're here, and they're here. So I, I think there's something that's um, uh, actually almost universal about chaos and the turbulence of existence. Uh, that gets touched on with this, and I wonder actually if the uh, if it, the emptiness is form form emptiness uh, seems relevant to any of you in this regard. Yeah. This uh, duality uh, is not only prevalent in Buddhism and uh, Hinduism and things like that, but also in physics. Uh, if you take a photon which is the source of light. Is it a particle or is it a wave? It's a particle sometimes, it's a wave sometimes. So I think all of these uh, things come because we are trying to describe nature which we really don't understand that well. And we have a certain language, we have a certain framework within which we try to describe them and it's always inadequate, uh, especially in the context you said you know, voice doesn't reach there, your eyesight doesn't reach there, you don't know what, what your, uh, you, I mean, by you I don't mean you particularly. We don't know really what reality is like. We only have an image of reality. And uh, we construct that image through a language that we have, we are aware of. And uh, this language is totally inadequate when you go very deep. And I think the example you gave, is uh, one of them, in my opinion. We just don't really know what the reality mm -hmm. is. Thank you. That's yeah. a good place to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? This will be our last, uh, last question. So I, I think I was listening to this conversation, and I think like a little bit like the discussion boils down to uh, human beings and art, I believe, are regulated by something that we call conscience. So we are aware of ourselves, what mm -hmm. we say, our thoughts, even if we don't control them. While in nature, in physics, we assume that like there is not a reading, it's more objective. We as, we, our traditional image of science is more objective. It's more objective, it's not related to that subjectivity. So what is the 
situation? Are we looking at science as an objective science, while in reality there is like a huge subjective part? Or our thoughts, our processes, are instead controlled by science? And so it doesn't exist. The conscience is just like our illusion. Well, some of us work in brain science, so yeah. uh, it gets murkier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, of course. Like, I was like not well, using the okay. right so, terms. So, the, so the, the, you know, part, one can take uh, situations in physics that seem very objective in black and white, um, and then you can get situations in physics that are, become harder to describe, and we've touched on some of those. Um, but you can go into biology and you can say, okay, we're going to use uh, magnetic resonance image and we're going to uh, induce oscillations in the molecules and, and see what kind of radio waves we get out and from that we'll be able to draw a picture of the brain. Um, and then we can see how brain activity modifies that and we get these patterns out, we start making. Um, but actually, if you're interested in understanding uh, human experience, you still have to talk to the people and ask them what they felt. Um, so some people are very interested in finding what parts of the brain are most active when we have the experience of beauty, and there's some argument about that. Um, and so, you know, one can develop rigorous methods that, um, uh, that we use to try and draw inferences about perception uh, based on uh, subjective reports of participants. And so I do that every day in my lab. Um, and, um, and it's pretty rigorous. Co color vision is pretty well established now, and we understand that color vision is a three-dimensional space. Um, and, uh, and some people work on consciousness. I happen not to. Um, but um, it's obviously an important phenomena in our lives. Um, but I'm not sure that it really raises that much of a philosophical problem. In, in, in my uh, work environment, it's a technical issue. It, consciousness gets very slippery. The first time you ask, someone asks you whether something is conscious, it seems like a clear question. The tenth time it, it, it's asked, it starts to seem like, like a, a weird philosophical question doesn't have a clear answer. Like, if I understand what you're saying related to my question, it's like that yes. individuality doesn't exist, so like the Picasso exists just because it happened at some point, the like that number of like molecules unite in a certain form and process a certain number of like electrical stimuli that generate, generate like art, what we call art. And it's not related to any subjective, unique essence of that human being. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that, uh, that follows. You know, uh, if you take, um, that's what I was trying to say earlier, if you take uh, uh, similar constituent elements, but they interact in different ways, you will get a different outcome. The base may be the same, mm. but you will get a different outcome. The, the essence of the question you asked, it seems to me, was, um, you're saying in science there is a clear distinction between the observer and the observed. Whereas in art, that is not. In fact, it is, it's the mixture of the two that makes it all the same. But your answer, quite rightly, was, you know, what at one time seemed very subjective can in fact be formulated now in a more objective way, or what appears to be more objective. There are still some issues that you cannot tackle, but maybe we will make more progress. And so the real answer is, Maybe there is uh, this distinction. Maybe that's because we don't understand it well enough. Maybe you're right. Who knows? I don't mm -hmm. know the answer, and, uh, but I think we are making progress in trying to link the two. I mean, that's how I see it, anyhow. As an artist, I've kind of worked through um, kind of oscillating between objective, subjective, my own conscious mm -hmm. experience. So, for example, I have this one piece that's about an earthquake. I was in the um, Tohoku, Tohoku earthquake in Japan, and I felt it with mm. my body. Um, and I wanted to make a work about it because it was um, an experience that was unforgettable, and it was very personal. So I, my first instinct was go find the data in Shinjuku, where I was, find the sensor, and 
try to look at that data in a bunch of different ways to understand the movement again. So I, experimented, I probably made like 20 to 30 experiments in different software, animating cameras, animating particles, um, taking the XYZ data, um, looking at it just as a typical seismic reading, and I finally um, realized that it was movement over time, so I was able to generate a curve, like a, a really dense curve. It almost looked like, um, uh, at the molecular level, like a bomb. It, looked, it was terrifying to look at, but it still was distilled, in, um, and it was still the data that was ruling, so I needed to rip that back into a subjective experience again, even though the data was objective at this point. It had been removed. Um, so I brought it back and I, um, I did a gestural painting of what I saw in the data. So it was like this kind of oscillation between, so I, that's something I'm dealing with all the time is someone making work, trying to, trying to solve that. And I don't, I don't think I ever will, but it's a really enjoyable mm -hmm. space to work through this kind of oscillation between subjective, objective, personal, looking at something at, a, at the way a machine would look at it, but that can never replace like what it what it felt like. Well, on on that note, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll have to leave things with some the beauty of some of these uncertainties, which make them perhaps all the more beautiful. I want to jo uh, ask you to join me in thanking our participants. Thank you, Luke, Dana, Sweeney, Dennis, and especially. Enrico, who, uh, who spearheaded the organization <laughs> of, uh, of, of this event, and thank you so much. Thank you for hosting us. Thank yeah, you. Thank you.